Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Cambridge Union. I'm Anna Stansbury. I'm the speaker's office in this term, and I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight for our first speaker event of this academic year. Today we have her, her, um, <laughs> today we have Princess Basma bin Saud of Saudi Arabia speaking to us on the topic from the Arab Spring to the European Spring to the global financial crisis. Before we start, I just have a few announcements. Photography and recording is absolutely prohibited. And please wait to ask questions until the question and answer session at the end where there will be microphones passed to you. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Her Royal Highness, Princess Basma bin Saud. I'll, um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to come here today. And I'm very privileged uh, to meet such wonderful people in such a wonderful place. It's my second time in Cambridge. So I'm really very much enjoying the, the scenery around and the weather looks lovely. So thank you for, for, for uh, inviting me to be here today. Now, I'm gonna, I was going to say ladies and gentlemen, definitely. Uh, but I'm going to say, of course, um, the youth around here makes me feel so uh, young again and uh, just remembering all my old days in, the, in Oxford, it gives me such a, a warm feeling. So I really thank you for welcoming me here tonight. And thank you for inviting me to speak at the Cambridge Union. It's a great honor for me to speak in such a hall where so many people and honorable people have spoken before. I am humbled to be included amongst the speakers who have gone before me. I hope it will inspire me to go out and seek the change of which I speak with more energy and determination. One thing um, that lacked uh, the, uh, uh, my speech, a word, which is, I call it the new way. I'm calling for a new way uh, to, for this world to step ahead, for the youth to come ahead and start a new way to look at things, a new constitution, a new name. I'm not going to name it. I don't have a name for it. But I think it's worth um, the challenge for all of you here to think of a new constitution, a new way to, for uh, the global community to start thinking about. We are living in a world of wars since before BC. And it's always been um, tragic that civilization rises and another one comes behind after wars and uh, desperation, misery, and dictatorships. And I think it's about time that humanity learns a lesson, a big lesson, that amongst all these periods of time, nothing came out except another misery, another uh, system that was OK at the beginning and then just went tumbling again and it took the world with him. So many empires. I'm speaking a place of learning, and I hope I learned something today. I really do. Will the youth come and listen and learn, and I hope that we can look to the youth for a better future and a leadership, and I'm sure that I, too, will learn from this experience a lot, and will be pri privileged to say one day, I have spoken in Cambridge Union. By birth, I'm a Saudi princess from the Saudi royal family. And by experience, an advocate of reform. I say reform and not revolution <coughs> because of the flames of the Middle East today show that revolution has not been the catalyst for lasting change that so many of us hoped for. Across the world in recent years, a lot has happened, but we have not seen change proportional to the upheaval. The charitable view is that the revolutions have been about sowing the seeds of ideas in people's minds about how real change 
can come. But it is now the time for reform to make the lasting changes, and central to all this is the field of leadership. The whole world is, leaking, is lacking leadership. And excuse me for saying that even the Western world, the globe, is lacking leadership. A good example. No country can avoid the winds of change, whether in the Arab world or anywhere else. You will hear that I mentioned mainly Europe and the Middle East today. But I could plug examples from the world over to illustrate these points. I've been everywhere. I've seen misery everywhere. I've seen hunger everywhere. I've seen dictatorship everywhere. But I don't see change right now, except in the Middle East. What we are facing now is a global issue, and I hope we can find a new way. I keep on saying a new way because I'm totally a believer that there should be a new way we should be thinking about right now in the academic world and the universities, down the streets, all hand in hand, the youth of producing a new system, not following all systems that have been written thousands and thousands of years ago. Democracy was in Greece, been produced in Greece. And since then, we've been calling for democracy in different shapes. Socialism, communism, republics, economical disasters that has resulted over the past two centuries. Have we learned? No, we have not. We keep on going again and again to the same systems. And now we are a globe. We are no more individuals. We are all one. Everybody is behind the screen seeing the other one in another country and tweeting each other from place to place. So really what applies here applies everywhere. So why are we calling again and again on democracy and not producing a new system that really can go on hand in hand with the technology and the youth of today, producing something which is new, like the technology we are producing, a new system? Are we unable to produce a new system? All these universities in the world, the Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, everywhere, everybody in the world is not, is not actually being able to produce one global new system that can be uh, applicable to all, a platform of humanitarian rights that can be applicable to people here in London, in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, in India, in Bangkok, in North America, South America, Canada, everywhere. By the end of the day, a poor man is a poor man, and the food is food. When he wants food, whether it's, it's uh, uh, paella, or it's kapsa, Saudi kapsa is rice, or it's fish and chips, at the end of the day, it's food. Everybody needs the same thing, but in a different language and a different shape. The European project is failing because economic union in the good times only papered over the cracks that the lack of politician union inevitably created. A rising tide lifts all boats, as Kennedy pointed out in a speech in Arkansas almost 50 years ago. And as we have discovered our coast, only the strong survive the storm. The tide has turned in Europe. What good is a single market? of 500 million when no one is buying. <clears throat> Many are painfully slow in coming, but at the same time, I do not join the chorus of universal condemnation. Results are best achieved when you work with and not against. I believe in reform, not revolution. Furthermore, at the cultural level, people's lives and rights change without the help of laws of wills of rights. This is much harder to perceive from afar. 
But no society is cast in stone. And we should never do so. They all live and breathe, though all with different degrees of latitude as they do so. But my main point here is that what governs societies are variables, not absolutes. In our globalized world of today, what happens in the Middle East has an effect on Europe. The world over, no one is immune to these upheavals and crises. Your problem is my problems, and vice versa. However, it seems that the ideas needed to take us forward are slow in coming. Very slow indeed. We need fresh ideas. We need youth. We need young seeds. We need fresh young leaders. It's about time the old step from governing the world. And we need to accept that the failures within the political systems we have been using to manage international and domestic cooperation are showing signs of serious and very serious distress to the extent that admitting defeat must surely be making its way up our to-do list. Approach and mindset to the future are key. In the post-war world, capitalism took spo the spoils and socialism bastions crumbled. Capitalism is now finding out what that is like in a way that was unthinkable just five years ago. However, it is no longer a question of being aligned to any ideology in particular. It had been a long time coming, and we didn't see it. But the playing field is leveling in new ways. Nevertheless, what we build now has to mean something for the generations to come, which are you. It cannot merely be a recasting of the old systems. We can no longer afford to think in terms of exceptionalism. The idea that somehow a region's or a country's problems are the idea, are neatly parceled up and cause trouble to them alone is no longer existing. On our increasingly level pay, playing field, our global problems are inextricably linked. Exceptionalism seems only to make differences stand out. When what I am talking about is drawing out the common ground, accepting mutual interdependence, not mutual siege. I see everybody has a cold, <laughs> as I do. My region, ha of course, has seen some serious upheaval. When I saw the first Middle Eastern country, Tunisia, begin its revolt, I felt sure that the threats would follow and tumble like a domino effect. I had no doubt whatsoever. I've been saying it for the past four years in my articles, in different journals, and different publications around the world. Bit by bit, they are doing so, even my country, Saudi Arabia, one that seemed robust, if only for its perceived wealth, it's vulnerable. Those countries that have been resisting the compelling car for change will either reform voluntarily or face revolt by populations who look around the region and find their expectations have been changed. 
to demand better and whose confidence has grown immeasurably when faced down by their state's security services. Out of the ruins of all this, what will emerge? I wonder. Do you wonder? Do you wonder what will emerge after all these revolutions? Have anybody really thought and pondered what's going to happen after all this? We're seeing tragedies being, people being slaughtered every day on TV. It's, it's like a, a daily meal on a daily basis while we sit in our homes cozy. Some of us are very lucky and most of us are not. And find that their expectations have been changed to demand better and whose confidence has grown immeasurably when faced down by their state security services. This is the last sentence I said, and I repeat it again, because it's security always that holds us back. Out of the ruins of all this, what will emerge? This is where my concern lies. The access to opportunity and basic human rights that so many fought for are slow in coming. Are they coming? Are they going to be coming? Are we fighting for human rights or are we fighting for another power? Is it another power that's going to take hold of the Middle East and the global systems? Another dictatorship in another form? Or is it humanitarian rights which are going to be prevailing and every humanitarian will prevail in his own right. I've got a friend of mine, I should not be speaking about it maybe today, but I want to speak about it because it matters so much to me. A friend of mine in the Philippines, she's been fighting human trafficking for the past 10 years, and she's just been accused of stealing her own organization by the government that was uh, sponsoring her. She was getting too dangerous for the government that sponsored her. And by humanitarian rights, they're slaughtering her. And she's been accused, and she's gonna be going, if not to prison, she's gonna be stopped from rescuing 500 girls every year. So what kind of systems are we talking about when we have powers up there who are really fighting humanitarian work and humanitarian activists all around the world once they step on their toes. Granted such were the accumulations of the case of autocracy that there was never any realistic chance that the transition would be smooth. Nobody said it's going to be easy. But while patience is certainly required, this is not to say passivity is required. We need to approach the future with vigor as we set about the process of rebuilding. Rebuilding. We have to rebuild and we have to start constructing our own buildings, our own shapes, our own cultures, expressing it in its most basic form. I am talking about moving forward and building upon the mistakes of the past and the sacrifices of so many. We in the Middle East are not the only ones rebuilding. Europe has little choice in the matter. This is about reform. Being the preferable course of action when it is undeniable that some sort of action must be taken. Action must be taken by everybody, especially by, you, by the youth. And I remember two days ago when I, when I you know, asked a very basic question. Um, you know, sometimes I just ask questions after I remember them, which I have no idea about. And I said, what, where did the democracy begin? I had no idea. Who invented democracy? And uh, they told me it was 400 BC. Somebody told me it's a Babylonian um, 
after the Babylon civilization, some people told me it's you have to. I have to Google it. I went to Google. I couldn't find a precise moment in history where democracy was born, but I found out that democracy was about small congregation of people who all voted and who all had something to do with building. So all of you have the responsibility to build, especially now you, the youth, who have the tools to communicate with each other in one second all around the world. Yes, we have nations and regions and tribes, pressures, groups, social classes, political parties, borders, financial systems that divide and discriminate. By why do we allow the things that divide us to stop us enjoying and benefiting from the things that unite us. Let's focus on the positive, on the things that unite us. And the starting point must be an understanding of the fundamental rights and laws that should apply everywhere. They do not have to start as complicated legal systems of which there are many examples the world over. They need to be simple and not so broad as to exclude anyone with different value systems and culture contexts. As examples, respect for each other, the right to a name, a right to education, a right to health, gender equality are all, in my view, fundamental rights. And I tell you from here, from this podium, that none of these exist in three quarters of the world. Particularly, there are many things to be considered social structures and balances, economic linkage and distribution, management of cyberspace. This is a very dangerous tool that we have created and we have not created laws that goes with it. Systems in place to ensure rights are respected. Respect is different than democratic rights and nobody understands this. When I have respect towards your ethics, your religion, where you come from has nothing to do with democracy and the right of speech. Particularly, there are many things within the social structures and balances and economic linkage and distribution we have to change and we have to respect, whether at an individual, national, or trans transnational level. This requires a new global charter along with human rights provisions that will guarantee economic, social, ethnic, and religious equality. I dream, I really dream, I dream every day, a new dream, and I strive every day to make that dream happen. For me, for my children, I have five children, three girls and two boys. And I see in them my dreams, as I see in you the future. I dream of a new approach for new generations tailored to each country and social context, including the very important but scarcely governed frontier of cyberspace. There is much to discuss there, naturally. I mentioned leadership. This is very crucial, to know how to lead. Everybody can be, can be a leader these days, with the right amount of money. But who knows how to lead? The youth have faded away following the revolutions and the subsequent politics have been conducted by people who cut their teeth under the previous autocratic regimes. This is what I see on this scene. The mechanics of government, the ministries and institutions continue to run inefficiently and unreformed to any noticeable extent. I know it's too soon to say noticeable, but at least not backwards. In other words, the moving parts in governments were designed to serve one master again and again, and again, 
and such institutional memory remains. Of course, one cannot simply wish history away. We are living in history. This is history, Cambridge's history. So there is a lot of things to learn from history. But at the same time, one, most, one must not simply wish the future wasn't coming. So the future one day will be history. The youth who have been forgotten in the aftermath must be seen as a central to global peace and cooperative governance, not adversal politics. From their ranks, the leaders of later on today must emerge, while they must be helped to learn from differing contexts, from differing experiences. Their own stamp is very crucial. After all, there are so many more of them and their peers, and there are gray men in suits. And the gray men in suits must willingly cede their knowledge and experience to them in spirit of learning and compassion for the future. Isn't this what they're preaching? The way forward starts with dialogue, which will not be easy or substantive without good leadership. But we hope it will be guided and decided upon by good and legitimate leaders. And at our most fundamental level, the similarities between people are greater than the differences. Reaching consensus is a wonderful thing. It can provide the common ground, the platform from which wider success and greater progress can be tackled. Basic human rights, equitable distribution of wealth, and gender equality is a minimum that I would accept. A new way is needed, whatever is called, everywhere. So let us start building and writing it for now and future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Princess for her fantastic speech. And we'll now move on to question and answers from the floor. So if you could raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Yes, in the front there. Please, sorry, please wait for a microphone. Thanks. Thank you very much for the speech. I think many here would um, join you in denouncing the way things work in the world and, and call for reform. Um, you've mentioned the need for universal human rights, for gender equality, for dialogue, uh, for leadership. But there are institutions currently which are trying and, and striving to, to achieve that. Uh, now, they may not be doing a great job, um, but things are slowly progressing. So, um, concretely, what directions should this reform take, according to you? Um, and, and perhaps precisely uh, in your country, in your own country, are there things which you are particularly pushing for? It should take up a stage. That's what I think. I think all the institutions that are striving now for human rights and reform and leadership should begin from up, down, not the way around. Because if nothing changes up, whether we reform and put, instead of these people who are actually uh, uh, being slaughtered on a daily basis to put somebody else on top of their governments. They have the same face, the same tailored uh, uh, suit. They will come back again and they will take humanitarian rights back again where it started. So what I think is that the world needs leadership to be taken seriously. Leadership is not something you just go for elections for, and you're a democratic person. This is not only enough. You should be prepared to be a leader. When you are 
a professor in Cambridge. You have to come with a big PhD to be able to attend with your uh, students, to, to, to be, become part of the faculty, don't you? So how about being a leader of a country who is responsible about every single thing in that country? You should be prepared. And preparing leaders is one of our most essential things that we lack. We have programs, but we, they have not produced anything because the people on top, they don't want it to produce anything because they want to have the role themselves. So they do allow you to go ahead with your program and they will back you up. But once you get there, they will not let you get there. They will not let you get on that chair. Like my friend in the Philippines, she's been fighting for human rights, uh, for um, uh, trafficking, human trafficking, for the past 20 years. And she's been backed by a very big and strong country that leads humanitarian causes. And once it came close to somebody there, they tapped her on her head and told her, you do not belong here. You're not actually to come to this line because you're touching our interests. So they accused her, they, they planted some things in her organization, and now she's facing court. Is that what you call humanitarian? We have the wrong approach towards humanitarian system. There must be a platform, a universal platform for everybody's rights, human right, Bill is not enough, the one that we have now. It's been built for people to disagree upon. This human bill right is not there for nations to sign for on because it has so many issues that are against every religion in the world. That's why people don't implement it because it does, they will tell you this is not my religion. That's a, that's a cause enough not to implement it. So I have no way of implementing human rights in Saudi Arabia or in, in Kuwait or in Bahrain because there are some things in the human rights bill that does not suit my mood or religion. So what do I do? I stick to the same human right or I produce another bill that they can sign, you can sign, I can sign and nobody can say no and then put it in the UN and once somebody steps out of line I make the same sanctions I do when I have security conflicts. This is what I think. Thank you. Um, yeah. Do you believe? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a believer. I get the job done. I'm a freelancer. Don't ask me where I'm from, though. But um, I wear this shirt. I come from Africa, right? I wrote your words on my screen, on my skin. Right. So when I get home, I write them down. Put this on any newspaper. Put it on China and everywhere. I burn this nation. God's son. I know this woman. Touch her. All my satellites will trace you. If you don't drop any gun. Um, we'll move on to another question. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's you. nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's for an activist. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, let's get spices a little bit to oh, the well. evening. Um. Please do. Your, your Royal Highness, um, your Royal Highness, um, in a, a country where a woman cannot drive, nor can she participate um, in the Olympic Games, um, and yet we in the West, we perceive that very country as an ally. Is it not the time for us um, to call things as they are and try to improve the situation of women in Saudi Arabia? I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like 
Does it? Does it answer it? Good. Well, my question is kind of continuing on that. You keep talking about governments and universal human rights, but Saudi Arabia does not have a very clean slate, and neither does the Saudi monarchy to which you belong. So I'm curious as to know what you, in your position of responsibility as a Saudi princess, has done for the rights of women in Saudi Arabia. Because... Your government has a notorious history in clamping down on human rights activist organizations in Saudi Arabia. So please elaborate. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'm not the government. Everybody takes me as somebody in the government. I'm not a minister. I've never been in the government. I've never been a responsible person. I've never taken position. I've refused to take position at one time because I could not deliver what you have said. I feel uh, exasperated. I feel frustrated because of the situation in Saudi Arabia and uh, the women back at home and I say back at home, I left a year ago because I could not do anything to further their status. I wrote, I opened, I tried to open organizations, I tried to open uh, universities and schools for security. It was called the Falcon to help women uh, educate themselves and to support their families. I could not go on with that uh, project and other projects that I have tried over the past 10 years in Saudi Arabia. Every time I took a step forward, I was pulled back. I wrote about it in Al Medina newspaper. I wrote about it in Al Hayat, in Al Ihram. I've uh, made a lot of enemies, if that's uh, says anything for me within my uh, society, especially women. You would be amazed how many women were against me when I started talking about women and their rights in Saudi Arabia. It's uh, a cultural thing. It is something to do with who does, who does what. And at the same time, I will tell you one thing. Women in Saudi Arabia are no better than men because there is no constitution to protect them. But definitely women rise up to the situation and they can protect themselves for now. And that's why in my website on my show talk, on TV, I said no to driving in Saudi Arabia for women because I know the moment they would step into the street, they would be abused, they would be beaten by men, and there's nobody to stop them. There's no law to stop them. So before I say anything or I continue, I would ask for a constitution to protect both genders, to give them their rights, and uh, really fight whoever is stopping this from happening as a beginning before I start going on to women's rights and the human rights. Thank you. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, my research is about gender and uh, youth and employment in the Arab world. So my question here is, 
what do you think um, youth need um, as policy, policy-wise, to um, help them integrate more into the workforce and ensure a gender representation at the same time? Thank you. Thank you. We need uh, from the elders to give their hands to the youth, whether by choice or by pressure. And we need to grow hand in hand together because uh, the youth are the uh, majority. And if you look at the percentages in the world, you would see 60%, I think, or 57% of the majority of the world is now over, uh, under 20. So you've got a majority and percentage that can really make pressure. But at the same time, we have to educate this, these masses. And we have to have the help of the elders to do so and to prepare the leaders of tomorrow because they're not looking beyond their noses. They are actually just concerned of their status today. So all of us here and at different parts of the world, if we unite and say one thing, which is one way, and each one of us, like they did thousands and thousands of years ago when they invented democracy, we do the same and think big, think new, not old. I think we can achieve something. That's all I can say. In the middle there. Uh, thank you for coming, first of all. Um, I really would champion your calls for peaceful reform in Saudi Arabia. Um, what I would say is it looks like you've tried peaceful reform already in all your writings and your uh, activist work and all of that. Um, do you not think that the, the government that which you are campaigning for reform against is just uh, intransigent to the extent that you can't deal with them? and that now is the time to call for a kind of uh, a takeover of sorts. Um, a revolution doesn't have to be a violent revolution. It doesn't have to be a Syrian bloodbath. It can be something like in Tunisia or like in Eastern Europe. And you are definitely the type of, the type of person who would be able to champion uh, and has the position of responsibility to be able to implement that kind of thing. So why wouldn't a revolution work if done peacefully? Because I'm a woman. <laughs> She just actually asked me about women in our country. They're not actually, uh, uh, even in my status, they're not taken seriously. And it is actually by my species that I'm not taken seriously. And I've been fought by the people within my uh, gender uh, because of my um, outlook. They think I'm totally crazy sometimes. They say it in their back homes, in their salon. And uh, they think I'm uh, not in my own right mind to leave all this wealth and this actually uh, peaceful um, entity that I had and just go and, and, and champion a cause around the world. So. If I have no unity inside and no belief in one person, how can I champion a cause? What I want and what you want is a beautiful thing, but revolution definitely is not an option because it will destroy everything. A reform is what I call for and for anybody who's listening to me right now or tomorrow or the day after on my website, maybe one day, one word of, that I say on one of these conferences will make a difference in my country, and it won't be too late for reform. Reform can come, as you said, peacefully, and, but definitely it won't come, people won't follow me in my society. We have a tribal community, which I try to explain to every human being outside our sphere. We are women, and women do not take hold in a Muslim religious communities. <laughs> They are asked, like Egypt, to go back behind the doors and start cooking again. Thank you.
Your Royal Highness, thank you for being here. Um, my question pertains to your notion of a human rights um, declaration or some list of human rights that would be um, agreed upon by people from various religious, um, philosophical, and moral perspectives. I think you identified very correctly the difficulty of um, having people from these different philosophical backgrounds agreeing upon what has been put forth um, up, into, up until this point. Um, but what if not religion, morality, uh, philosophy would um, encourage people to sign on to some universal notion of human rights? Um, what would that notion of human rights look like? Would it become so minimalist that it actually failed to achieve the kind of reform that um, you're seeking? I was just, I would just say, as I said in my, in my actual speech, minimal reform is just to, to, to secure basic human rights, social uh, uh, advantages, health, education, security, uh, protection, wealth distribution. This is the minimal actually you would have as human rights. After that, each country would tailor it upon its, its, its beliefs, its, its religion, whatever is, is acceptable to them. As in per. Uh, uh, you would uh, vote for what is okay for your society or not. But you have a platform where you sign on in the United Nations guaranteeing the equality of all your citizens in these domains. These domains, when they are covered, when you are educated, you are fed, you are uh, uh, given social security, you are being... Uh, 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 um, you have hospitals, you have everything which every human being should have uh, as, as a uh, dignity uh, to be able to live as a human being. When all this is guaranteed, everything else will be tailored. But we have to guarantee to protect these human rights, these basic human rights, which are not protected, neither in Africa nor, nor in, uh, uh, in America, South America, uh, North America, South America, uh, nor in, in, uh, in East Europe, nor in the Middle East. So you've got a vast uh, uh, proportion of the world which is not governed by these minimal human rights. Why? because there are so many other articles in the Human Rights Bill in the United Nations that these people will not agree to sign on, like the rights of, of uh, uh, homosexuality, like uh, the right of, of women uh, liberty, like the right of living alone without, matron, uh, without being married. They will never agree to do that. And if they do, the religious people will slaughter the government, the people on the top. So both of them, they want to maintain that, that uh, position. So we have to have the minimal, at least, to agree upon. What do you think will incentivize states to agree to ensure the minimal basic rights? If they can ever come up with a definition, what will bring states to the table When the United Nations takes over her right, her, her position again, when people actually really start um, you know, taking uh, their, their position seriously. Until then, we're gonna be played for money and, and wars and, and uh, weapons. I mean, that's, that's basically the whole game. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. The question, at the, oh, sorry. the question at the top there. Hi. Um, Hi. I wanna thank you, first of all, for speaking here. You're doing well. It's for, sorry, it's for the recording. So. Okay. Um, thank you for speaking here, and I think you made a very good speech. I was just thinking that um, a few weeks ago, the American ambassador in Libya was um, assassinated, and there were protests um, across the region because of a video that came out in California about, by some criminal goof. And, and I think that you know, every, every so often, every few years, whether it's Salman Rushdie or it's another writer, someone comes out and criticizes Islam and all of a sudden there's these mass protests and people are, people are, people are killed, people are injured, people are hurt. Um, the very right that this society is premised on is the absolute right to free speech. And I think that in many parts of the Middle East, that's a right that is not respected. And I know that you said that we should reform some of these rights or you know, we should rethink them. Do you think that there is an absolute right to free speech? If not, what justifies limits to free speech, including criticism of Islam? 
respect. I think respect is our ethics. It's our ethical um, uh, beliefs that should restrict us from stepping over uh, other people's beliefs. I cannot go to Mexico and just say uh, uh, some uh, uh, abnormalities about Catholicism or, or whatever. It's, it's, not, it's not ethical. It's not respect. When you respect other people, this is when you stop. Freedom, everybody's freedom stops where the other freedom begins. So this should be universal as of uh, freedom of, of, of speech. It, she, it should be restricted within yourself, within laws. Because if you don't have ethics, the whole world will be a whole jungle, more than it is a jungle right now. So do you think that Muslims have, or anyone has the right to respectfully criticize Islam? Anybody should criticize, but not actually uh, uh, say, uh, imaginable things about each other. I, cannot, I mean, I could say in so many words, uh, you, have, you are overweight, but I won't say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. But I wouldn't say you have, you have beautiful muscles, right? When I say you have beautiful muscles, you will feel good but when I say you're, old, you're overweight, you will just actually hate me for it. So this is the difference. It's actually, I have to think of you as you think of me. You might think me too thin or too, too, too uh, whatever it is, but this is about ethics. Um, just with all due respect, if you called me overweight or no, whatever no, you called, no, 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 all I'm saying is that I wouldn't protest on the streets if you called me that. That's all I'm saying. And no, 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 definitely not, but I'm giving you an example. <laughs> You wouldn't start a campaign against me on YouTube, would you? <laughs> no, I, it is basically, it's basically, actually, you're talking from Cambridge. You're not talking from down the streets in the Arab world or in the Muslim world. They have no education, my dear. They are living on a daily basis of how to find food, how to feed their bellies. If you tell them, Muhammad, they will just write, even if you're just saying, you're, you're going to continue and say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they will beat you, even if you say it. But they will not, actually, they are not conscious of this. There is no awareness. There's no I mean, awareness, lack of awareness, that you don't, we do not understand here when we're here. But if you go back there, you will understand it, you will see it, you will feel it, you will touch it. They are ignorant about these things. Most of the people are on the streets on the right and who have actually uh, uh, went and, and really uh, just beat up everybody around are people who did not watch the movie. They do not have internet. They've just heard about it. Do you believe that? Pardon? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Do you believe that most of the people on the streets who went and were and in the riots and did the damage, did not even see the movie. No, most people didn't. I exactly. Didn't sort of exactly. No, but I'm, te I'm, I'm telling you, this is an example of how much ignorance there is. You are talking to people who are ignorant, who has not been educated, and this is very important to understand. Uneducation, this is what makes you a human being. In the Quran, it says, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he taught the human being what he didn't know, what he doesn't know. Al-ilm, it's education. If you're not educated, you're as equal as anything in nature. So this is basically, that's why we have to have respect to each other's ethics, religions, colors, sizes, whatever it is. We have to have respect to each other regardless of anything that happens anywhere else in the world. This is what I said on my website. I do understand both sides. So this is my belief. Thank you.
Yeah, no, it's <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, coming to Cambridge. Thank uh, you. So in Saudi Arabia, especially in Saudi Arabia, one of the most effective ways of, of uh, repressing and, and keeping your, your population not... Not my about, population. No, 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 you I'm, keep I'm, on I'm telling me, me, no, no, no. me. <laughs> so in, in my general, population. Keeping, keeping the Saudi or any similar population under control and not have the idea of revolters by saying Islam does not allow that uh, or by saying that your religion does not allow revolution, uh, which personally and, and according to the, the, the belief of most Muslims uh, is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, and also to suggest that women do not have a role in revolution, especially in the, in the revolutions in, in Tunisia, Egypt, etc. And when you suggested that it's impossible because Islam, uh, because of Islam, are you not reiterating exactly the, the same reasons uh, used by the, the, the authorities to suppress uh, revolution and by just giving an abstract uh, and generalized uh, notion that you should have reform and you have a new way but with, without giving uh, an indication or any change from the norms which is Islam does allow women to, to vote. Islam do, has nothing to do with it. Uh, Islam does not tell women not to drive. Uh, are you not saying the same thing, but in a, in a different form? Can I ask you something? Yep. Did you ever visit my website? Uh, no. Okay, go. No. But, but, but I lived in Saudi Arabia most of No, no, of no, go. no, you're talking to me now and asking me a question that I have you know, I've answered since six years. I've been writing and writing about women's right to not to drive, to be a human being first and then to drive, to be part of society, to travel, to have any basic right like any other human being on earth. I've been writing about it. I've been a subject to uh, criticism from everywhere because I travel alone. I defy uh, the laws of nature by taking my children, my girls, outside Saudi Arabia by, by letting them go on, on tube, by being an example in singing and, and going and, and uh, filming schools. I've done quite a lot and I'm still doing. And I just came from New York. Sorry, so, so I don't question that. No, I don't support. I am actually, I'm doing an example. Absolutely, but by saying that it is religion uh, that, is, uh, that, that is a barrier, uh, and, and obviously we know that almost all the, the, the population in Saudi Arabia are religious, and it's almost you've shut the door for them and said, look, there's no way out because it is, uh, your religious says you can't do this, whereas that's not the case. I didn't say that. I said exactly the opposite in my articles. I said, we have misinterpreted religion. We have misinterpreted the Quran. We have misinterpreted the message of Muhammad. His wife actually was the bearer of all his hadith, which is his sayings. Uh, his daughter taught her how to uh, drive a horse, fencing and swimming. So how can I say the opposite? I'm not saying that, you just misunderstood me. I said they believe, they make you believe that this is so. And this is what I am trying to open the doors for, the right interpretation of Islam. But what I am seeing is that a fierce battle against me, against my voice, from the women inside Saudi Arabia and in the Arab world. And some of them are now in the Congress, in the, in the Egyptian Congress, by being put there by the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. I have <coughs> sat with them in the Congress in Prague, and we talked. And uh, what I found out is exactly the same thoughts we have in Saudi Arabia, that women's place should be behind doors. This is what they're promoting for, and this is what I'm against. I've been doing this on the website, and my actions 
um, conferences like this, being part of boards, leadership boards for youth. Um, I've been doing what I can as a human being, but if you are not backed by money and power, you will not get where you want to get, like you have not visited my website. So you could not actually come to me and, you know, uh, uh, really with an issue that I haven't mentioned there. So I really need uh, uh, the explo ex exposure to be backed up by youth, by people who believe in what I believe. Otherwise, we won't achieve anything. I'm one voice against an, an ocean of waves. So one day, I might be the biggest wave. You never know. Um, I think that you're absolutely right to say that human rights are key and obviously I'm sure everyone in this room agrees that human rights should be advanced as much as possible. Hi. <laughs> um, but your idea that if we come up with a sufficiently, say, minimalistic set of human rights that everyone will agree to, it, it seems very optimistic to me. You, you counted gender equality as one of those very basic human rights that you hoped everyone would agree to, whereas you said that there were some things on the current Convention of Human Rights that no one would agree to. Um, it seems optimistic to me that everyone's going to agree to gender equality, but that's one of those things that you've said ought to be on our very basic list of human rights. Do you think that this is practical? Definitely it's practical, because actually it can be argued in so many religious books. I mean, you know, um, uh, first and most, uh, the Quran gives equality to men and women and everything except in heritage. But otherwise, everything is, is black and white. And now democracy has been built on equality, gender equality. And everything around the world revolves in, around gender equality. So it's one major thing that we can push and make sure there is one of the essentials because everybody's calling for democracy. And this is one of the main things of democracy. So why not put it in the front of the human rights? Because when you put gender equality, it means and responsibilities and in, um, in, every, in, in every aspect of life. So it's, this is the main issue and the main thing, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, you know, two parts of one soul, as we say. So this is not actually, uh, we're not going against the trend of a human uh, uh, evolution or a human uh, um, um, education. We've always, you know, when you're born, you're taught to be a girl or a boy. But nonetheless, you are treated like a human being. You're a baby. So at the beginning, you're, you're okay. But later on in life, when you start actually, you know, taking these parts of life, this is when you, you start to find, you know, the inequality, even here in England and in America. I know two people at the same position, a woman and a man. A man takes much more money, actually, you know, as a wages than the, the woman. So we've, we've got um, inequality in so many manners and colors. So if you have this major thing being put in the United Nations, rising this issue, it means that you are tackling the basic main human rights. How do we uh, get there? This is why I'm here. I'm talking to the youth everywhere. We, you have to do something about it. It's not my days. It's the days of my children. That's why I keep on pushing my children. I keep on pushing my girls, my boys. And I scream at both of them the same way. So <laughs> this is how I want to raise them. And this is how I, you know, I, I hope that you will push at the same time, the same way. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you've been talking about creating a platform of rights, but you always refer back to religion. Shouldn't rights 
be independent of religion and come before that anyway. Definitely. But that's why I'm calling for the human rights to be completely away from religion. And each country can tailor it to its own religion and culture and background. Yeah. That's why. I mean, this is why fundamentally I'm calling for basic human rights. So nobody can put religion in the middle of the human rights bill and say this is my religion, I cannot sign on it. I'm asking this before because you said, uh, for instance, in the, in the Quran there is no limitation to uh, women's uh, rights, for instance. But why do we need to back women's rights up with religion in the first place? Can it be just women's rights because it's women's rights rather than because the Quran does not deny them? I didn't say that. I was referring as an example, sorry. It was an example. It was, I wasn't referring to the Quran. I was referring to all the uh, main uh, books in, in Christianity and Judaism and, and um, uh, Quran and all civilization. Really, they are born the same. It's not only the Quran. But I said this is as an example. And because I come from a Muslim family, so it's the best example I can find. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us tonight on behalf of the Union Society and, and the entire student population. I just have one question, if this is the last one, to close off the evening. And that is, you've, you've spoken very strongly in favor of a global change, which I think we can all believe in. But what can the people in this room do? What can we take away today knowing the steps we personally can take to make that difference? What can we do when we leave this room and how can we go about our days to actually bring about the change that you'd like to see in the world? The most important question of the day. We, you start here, a nucleus, and you connect and contact with other universities in the world, with other countries, who have boards for youth, you start a movement, like anybody else, like you do on YouTube and every, anything, a campaign, but you do it seriously this time. You contact people in Harvard, people in Yale, in Oxford, in London, you start by creating nucleuses everywhere. And then you connect and you make a force, and from that force, you'll be a force yourself for the next generations. I think this is where you should start. Thank you very much uh, for um, having me here. It's been a lovely night, a little bit too warm. And uh, you've been uh, exceptionally nice to me. And uh, I know maybe I'm, I'm too uh, optimistic, but I believe in the youth. I believe in the future. I believe we can do something even though there's a lot of obstacles. But I know and I believe if we plant a seed now, it will grow tomorrow. I can do it in my garden, you can do it in your backyard. Thank you. I just want to say on behalf of everyone, thank you again to Her Royal Highness Princess Vazma Bent Saud. And just a few announcements for everyone here. This is the end of our open week tomorrow with our debate about the music industry. Those of you who aren't members, do come along tomorrow to our debate and do join mem to become members of the society before Saturday when the membership fee will go up. We'd love to see you again at our debate tomorrow, at our event with His Holiness Radhanath Swami on Monday, and at our event with Bill Oddi. I hope you have a fantastic evening, and thank you all for a great discussion. Thank you. <laughs>